Joining us online is Michael Eisenberg. He's co-founder and partner at Aleph, a venture capital fund focusing on partnering with great Israeli entrepreneurs to build large, meaningful companies. Also, he is the author of a brand new book titled The Tree of Life and Prosperity, Economic Principles from the Book of Genesis for the 21st Century. It's out right now. Michael, thanks so much for joining the show. Really appreciate it. Thank you, Ben, for having me. So I think that one of the things that that folks fail to recognize when it comes to economics is, is how tied into fundamental principles about human nature economics are. And we tend to hear people talk about how we need to make the economy work for us or we need to shift how the economy is done in order to achieve particular utopian goals. But one of the things that, that the very nature of your book points out is that human nature is deeply interconnected with how we deal with, with property, how we deal with, with economics more generally. So what do you think is sort of the, the deep-rooted basis for, for economics? You know, when uh, I first launched the book in Hebrew, I did a panel with a well-known rabbi in Israel named Rabbi Benny Lau, and he said, you know, my first takeaway from your book is that people are people are people and have been for 3,000 years. And, you know, we have to address what causes people to do what they do. And one of the stories I tell in the book is about Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden. They had universal basic income there which is all their needs were provided for in the Garden of Eden. Man didn't talk to woman. Adam didn't talk to Eve. Eve was so bored she talked to the serpent because there was nothing to do. And this despite the godly commandment that they need to work and guard the garden. But everything was provided. It didn't work. Only man, once man is expelled from the Garden of Eden, does he begin to work. When it's hard and struggle, and by the way, there are no children in the Garden of Eden either. Because once you don't struggle and need to, need to work, um, you don't value work and you don't value creation and therefore... Uh, procreation. And ironically, we just had a live lab of this during Corona, which is, you know, I didn't expect to have a live lab for my theories and, you know, the Garden of Eden modern times. But when we give out checks to people, they don't go back to work. It's actually that simple. And so human nature is such that only when man is forced to work does he become productive. And no kind of graduation speech from Mark Zuckerberg is going to change that. You know, it, it is uh, pretty incredible how this seems to be completely overlooked. I mean, Nancy Pelosi uh, famously suggested that once you get rid of the dependency on a job that, that people will actually be allowed to just fully flourish because that's what welfare states have, have created is, is a community of thriving art uh, at the bottom of the income spectrum. That the, the, the people who are, who are on you know, social benefits, those are the people who are most likely to be creating all of your great artistic work, striving and innovating. Uh, it's it's a, a bizarre vision of human nature that suggests that basically when you give people things, they will continue to be as innovative, productive, uh, and, uh, and high-minded as they would be if they were actually forced into a situation where they had to do those things in order to in order to reach prosperity. You know, you know, what we don't respect enough is human dignity. Human dignity is tightly coupled with work and productivity. And that is, if I work, I am productive and I have what to be proud of in it. People don't just work to get a paycheck. People work to create and earn their dignity. And we've totally overlooked that. And when you earn dignity, you can become creative and procreative. Because only out of dignity does this happen. You know, in the Bible, there is no such thing as like what I would call, you know, just giving out charity. Um, a man who was a farmer, a well-to-do landowner, as was the case back then, leaves over a corner of his field in biblical uh, charity, quote unquote. And that's the poor people or the people who aren't of means, the, the orphans and the widows, come work his field. He just leaves them in peace. They don't get free handouts. They have to go to work and turn up and harvest the field. And through that, they earn a skill and they feel productive. And they get the human dignity that goes along with it. And then they can become creative and rejoin the workforce. And I think that's an important biblical model that we just totally lost sight of uh, in, in some of the dialogue that's going on right now. Let's talk more broadly about the Bible and its importance, because one of the things that, that's happened in the West is, is a, a, an ever encroaching sense that the Bible doesn't matter anymore, that biblical worldviews are foolish, that this is all a book of, of myth and, and magic and superstition. Uh, and yet the reason that this document has been so durable for 3,000 years is because it has stood the test of time. And it seems like in the in the post-scientific era, there's a belief that only the quote-unquote verified form of knowledge that you can see in social science studies, which goes through peer review by, by liberal professors, only that sort of stuff can be respected. But, but the test of time means nothing. And that, that's a very weird way of, of viewing wisdom because the wisdom of the past is in fact a form of knowledge that, that has gone through a lot more testing and, and, and a lot more verification than many of the studies that are coming out five minutes ago. This is a point that Frederick Hayek makes with regard to, to how we generate knowledge in the world. Thomas Sowell makes the same point, that, that it, you, you don't have to believe in the, the literal Adam and Eve story with the serpent in the garden to understand that the wisdom of that particular story has been tried and tested over time and found to be necessary. 
Yeah, it's absolutely true. You know, I, I often joke that the, the Hebrew Bible has more uh, unique users than Google and Facebook combined, uh, certainly over history, but probably even in, in modern times. And not just that, it's been relevant for every generation over 3,000 years, and there's been more commentary written on it to make it relevant to those generations than, than anything else. And a friend of mine, Balaji Srinivasan, said, you know, this is like wisdom of ancients for moderns uh, in kind of relation to my book. And I think it's true of the Bible uh, in general. And so I think that that's, you know, point one. But there's another part is that the Hebrew Bible in particular, the Bible in general, cuts across so many different disciplines. You know, you mentioned peer review before. What is peer review if not kind of narrowism, you know, constructed as departments in universities? And we, we, we kind of, if we're peer reviewed uh, by this, we keep kind of a narrow focus. But the Bible is multidisciplinary. And the best innovation, by the way, is also multidisciplinary. And so the Bible is able to keep being innovative because it talks about torts, because it talks about human dignity, because it talks about innovation in the story of Noah, because it talks about wealth in the story of Abraham, because it talks about how we deal with disadvantaged populations in the book of Leviticus and how we deal with uncertainty in the book of Numbers. And so this is highly relevant. And we need that interdisciplinariness of the full five books to kind of get at modern problems. Well, the book, again, is The Tree of Life and Prosperity, Economic Principles from the Book of Genesis for the 21st Century, the author, Michael Eisenberg. Michael, thanks so much for joining the show. Really appreciate the time. Thank you, Ben. I really appreciate your hosting me.